Welcome to Network Academy. We will continue our discussion with the types of area network. The fundamental difference between a switch and a router is that a switch belongs only to its local network and a router belongs to two or more networks. The router acts as a gateway between multiple networks, but a switch even if there are multiple switches, can only communicate within a single network. Recall that a nodes on a local network communicate directly with one another. However, a node on one LAN cannot communicate with a node on another LAN without a router to manage that communication and to stand as a gateway between the networks. Routers are often referred to as a gateway devices or just gateways. Now that you understand the basic functions of switches and routers, you're ready to make the distinction between the two terms host and node. A host is any endpoint device such as computer or printer connected to a network that hosts or accesses a resource such as an application or data. So far, you've learned about local area networks. What about the network outside the local network? Let's look at the other types of networks, which primarily vary according to the geographic space and the specific connection technologies they use. A group of local area network that spread over a wide geographical area is called wide area network. A group of connected lands in the same geographical area, for example, a government office surrounding a state capital building is known as a metropolitan area network or campus area network. Although in reality, you won't often see those terms used or they might be used simultaneously. The network functions are separated into seven categories in the OSI reference model. This separation of networking functions is called layering. The OSI reference model has a seven numbered layers, each illustrating a specific network function. We will discuss each of these layers and their function. The layers are as follows, physical, data, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. Layer 1, the physical layer. It is responsible for sending bits via wired or wireless transmission. These bits can be transmitted as a wavelength in the air, for example, Wi-Fi, while for the wired connection, it can be a voltage on a copper wire, for example, Ethernet on twisted pair cabling or light, which you can be seen on a fiber optic cabling. Layer 2 and 1 are responsible for interfacing with the physical hardware on a local network. The protocols at these layers are programmed into the firmware of a computer's network interface card and other networking hardware. Layer 2, the data link layer, is commonly called the link layer. The type of networking hardware or technology used on a network determines the data link protocol used. Examples of the data link protocols are Ethernet and Wi-Fi. The network layer, sometimes called the internet layer, is responsible for moving messages from one node to another until they reach the destination host. This is the layer where routers typically function. The principal network used by the network layer is IP, which is internet protocol. IP adds its own network layer header to the segment or datagram, and the entire network layer message is now called a packet. The network layer header identifies the sending and receiving hosts by their IP addresses. An IP address is an address assigned to each node on a network, which the network layer uses to uniquely identify them across multiple networks. Layer 4, the transport layer. It is responsible for transporting application layer payloads from one application to another. The two main transport layer protocols are the TCP and UDP. The session layer of the OSI model describes how data between the applications is synced. 
and recovered if messages don't arrive intact at the receiving application. In the OSI model, the presentation layer is responsible for reformatting, compressing, or encrypting data in a way that the application on the receiving end can read. The application layer in the OSI model does not contain applications themselves, such as web browser, but instead it describes the interface between two applications. The application, presentation, and session layers are so intertwined that in practice, it's often difficult to distinguish between them. Also, tasks for each layer may be performed by the operating system or the application. How often have you heard the complaint that I can't get on the network or the network is slow? This description of the problem, they're not very helpful because they're not very specific. Everyone has a different approach of solving problems, but we can all agree that the best method is to have a clear definition of the problem before you start. Unfortunately, the end users may not always be very detailed with the description of the problem. Is it a consistent problem? Is it intermittent? Is it isolated to one user? Or is it occurring to multiple users? Maybe it only appears at a certain times of the day or the issue cannot be duplicated. So this means before you start troubleshooting, you need to ask all the necessary questions to clearly define the problem. You need to remember that troubleshooting doesn't have any right or wrong procedure, yet it works best with the logical methodology. You need to clearly define the problem, understand any possible triggers, and know the expected behavior. The top-down approach is also the most straightforward troubleshooting approaches because the problems that user reports are usually defined as the application problem. Starting the troubleshooting process at the layer is a natural thing to do. You usually choose the top-down approach when you believe that the problem is most likely at the application or the other upper OSI layers. The common reasons for believing that the reported problems are related to users, applications, or at least upper OSI layers includes the following. First, it comes from past experiences, new software applications, changes in the user interface, and also added security features. The top-down troubleshooting approach is usually most suitable for problems that one person or only few people experience because lower layer, uh, that is actually the network infrastructure problems, usually affect more than one person. The bottom-up approach starts from the physical layer of the OSI model and it works its way up on the application layer. This method is affected if the problem is located in the network infrastructure because of most of the networking problems occur in the lower layers of the protocol stack. The troubleshooting of bottom-up approach is starting with the physical components of the network and works through the layers of the OSI model. If you conclude that all the elements that associate with the particular layers are in good working condition, then you need to inspect the elements that associate with the next layer up. You need to continue this process until you identify the causes of the problem. Your goal is to eliminate more potential problem causes so that you can narrow the scope of the potential problems. Next would be the divide and conquer. This troubleshooting approach is a compromise between bottom-up and top-down troubleshooting. You need to start in the middle, that's why it's divide and conquer, such as the network layer performing a ping and then doing a trace route and then based on the success, you can work your way either up or down in the protocol stack. The last on the troubleshooting method would be the follow the path approach. Basically, you will just follow the path that the traffic should be taken through the network to get to the destination. This way, you could eliminate the alternate path and focus on the primary one while troubleshooting links that are irrelevant to the problem. The method that you choose, either bottom up, top down, or follow the path will depend on the questions you ask and also what are the users are reporting as a problem.
This approach can quickly lead you to a problem area. You can try to pinpoint the problem to a device or any particular physical or logical components that either broken or misconfigured or has any bug. I hope you learned a lot on our discussion from the part 1 and part 2 and that concludes the introduction to networking. Again, thanks for watching.